Welcome, and thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Many of us, when we lay our pillow down onto the bed and our head on top of that, find our eyes closed, go off into a world that's unknown to us. Sometimes it's strange, but we some most of the time find ourselves to be those active participants and sometimes just inactive observers. It's simply known as dreams. Today we're going to be talking with author Jillian Holloway. Her book is The Complete Dream Book, and today we're going to be talking about scary dreams and the art of dream interpretation. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Jillian Holloway. Jillian, thank you for joining us. Oh, hi, Daniel. It's a treat to talk to you again. Wow, the fun nightmares, the things that people dread when they go to sleep. Tell us about why this happens. Well, nightmares are usually a combination of a stressor that's going on in your current life. No surprise there. And there's something about that particular stressor that makes it hard for you to cope with. I wanted to talk a little bit today about some of the really perplexing images in our dreams, which are usually the monsters. You know, we associate monsters with kids, the nightmares you have when you're a kid. But we still have monsters in our dreams as adults. And it's particularly baffling because we don't believe in them. We don't know anybody that looks like that, like a zombie or a vampire. But So where do these monsters come from? And they're particularly common in certain age groups. For example, men are really inclined to dream about zombies. Women, not so much. And I find that the zombie dreams are about something that's a threat to the person's sense of self because zombies would like to come in and kill you and make you one of them, right? They have a set of rules. Mm -hmm. But this is not a funny, you know, I mean, it sounds funny to talk about, but it's not funny when you have the dream. And for a lot of men, there can be a stressor that uh, it can be work-related where you're supposed to become part of this troop of, workers without regard to the cost on a per, in a personal sense. So I suspect that might be one reason why men between the ages of 25 and 40 are particularly prone to these zombie dreams. Mm-hmm. Now what about for women? What are they typically, what are the monsters they usually have in their dreams? Women are more prone to having um, oversized animals, and I include that loosely in the monster category, you know, like a giant boa constrictor, a giant python, or um, an oversized lion that's in your living room. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy in the dream, but these are, again, threats where the monster is a lot bigger than life, a lot bigger than you are, and that, usually in a dream, suggests that you feel at a particular disadvantage with the challenge that you're dealing with. For example, if it's an in-law that threatens and bullies you, well, there are certain rules against telling off your in-laws. You, you kind of have to live with them. But if you've got a bully in your family, it's no picnic. And so that's the same relationship that a little kid has to a huge monster in a nightmare, and that's why these dream creatures can be so larger than life sometimes. Wow. So women tend to have monsters in their dreams that are associated with animals, whereas men it tends to be more of the human type. Is that what you're saying? Well, very typically. I can run through the statistical most common uh, monsters if you want, and you can pick whatever you want to talk about. (laughs) But the most common, and this is interesting, the most common is zombies, and that's men from 25 to 40. The next most common are the vampires, Mm -hmm. and that's usually girls from 15 to 20 or so. Well, that's mainly because of that big Twilight series, I think. Well, it could be, but, you know, I saw this even before the Twilight series. Ah, okay. So I think it's more likely that the Twilight series became popular because the image of the vampires and the ambiguity of the vampires, you know, they're kind of sexy, but they're also the undead, um, was in our psyche. And that's why we lit up when those... uh, either the, the Vampire Lestat series or the more recent Twilight series uh, came out. Now, what's really interesting when you think about, <clears throat> excuse me, dreaming about monsters or having nightmares as children versus being adults is that we feel, I think, more threatened as children when we tend to have these nightmares. And I think back to a movie back in the 80s called Dreamscape. And it was a fascinating movie because they were toying with the idea in the movie that you can actually go in and help someone who's having terrible nightmares 
basically face up, become lucid, and, and you know, take care of it. And this kid was just having this really nasty dream. I thought, boy, I've never had anything this weird before, but it was about a giant man cobra is mm-hmm. what it was. So it was actually, you know, walked like a man, but it had a big head of a cobra would come up and it you know, take apart his dad and then come after him, you know, and I thought, wow, you know, well, that's got to be pretty overwhelming for a child, but is it usually more intense for kids than adults? Well, it's it's really equally intense. That's okay. the funny part. You know, kids can tend to worry when they wake up, like, oh, I'm going to have that dream again, or is there something really under my bed? Whereas the adult, of course, is not going to say, oh, well, there's a dinosaur under my bed. He's not going to worry about that. But in the dream, it's just as real and just as overwhelming. And the thing to keep in mind is that we're dreaming up these monsters because there is something real in waking life Mm -hmm. that is a particularly difficult problem to solve. You know, monsters are not just nasty because they want to eat us or kill us or get us or take our soul or make us join their team. Monsters are difficult because they're, they're not easily gotten rid of. You can't just call the sheriff and say, look, would you get rid of this werewolf in the backyard? Mm -hmm. Because that thing is resistant to the normal solutions to problems. And monsters in our dreams represent a real challenge that is also resistant to the normal solutions. And that's one reason why the monster is picked by the mind to represent the problem. Now, here's a a really interesting example because... of how things were in America after World War II. You know, we really didn't have anything really intense or major. I mean, Vietnam was on the horizon, but that seemed to be worlds away while we were here safe in our own country. But what was it like after 9-11? I I came across some research I was doing here along with your book about 9-11 and the type of dream that people are actually having more on an international level. But talk about that, for instance. Well, one really stunning thing that happened after 9-11, we were all, in fact, the the word went out to all the people around the world who work with dreams and who are experts to be available to people for free who are having nightmares because it really, you know, obviously shook shook everybody up. Um, But the thing that we were expecting was nightmares about terrorism in all its different imaginable forms. But what we found were nightmares about dinosaurs, Nightmares that looked like Jurassic Park in New York City. Mm -hmm. Nightmares of giant reptiles or um, like alligators that could walk on their hind legs. Mm -hmm. And this was the thing that was most common in people's dreams for a couple of years after 9-11. Wow. And we don't have a really tidy explanation for why reptiles became the the monster of our dreams, but it was, de- I mean, it started the day after 9-11, so it was pretty clearly linked to the ripple effect of fears and uncertainty and horror around that. So that's an example of, it's very fascinating to look at our collective dreams sometimes, and around the time of the O.J. Simpson trial, men slashing up people indiscriminately, you know, men with knives, people getting their throats slit, that became the nightmare of choice for a long time after that. Now, it's just an interesting stab in the dark, but I would think with the reptilian dreams that, you know, that's our reptilian mind, as we're told, and that's made for survival. And I just wonder if maybe that's what that dream was about. Well, that make, that's as good a theory as any, Daniel, and uh, mm-hmm. that's one that has been floated, and I think there's probably, you know, some, if not all, truth to that, because it, it was sheer rage on rage, and the potential for that to escalate, uh, just like, you know, monsters fighting each other. Uh-huh. So so that makes a great deal of sense. Hmm. Fascinating stuff here. Now, um, if you have a series of dreams about a particular monster, how can somebody kind of take a look at that and learn from it? You, it's, it's very important, in my opinion. If you have a series of dreams about a monster, you've, you're not only having a peak stress experience, which might explain one dream, but you've got something that's ongoing that really presents a threat to your sense of self or in a, in a way is dehumanizing you. That's one of the things that monsters want us to do. Uh, they want to do to us, rather. Uh, so it, whether it's a work situation or uh, just any, anything where you feel like you're being dehumanized, look for that situation in your life. Now, the dream is it's exaggerating it to make it memorable, to get your attention, to illustrate that there is a cost to you. Describe the particular t- traits of the monster 
What is it like? What makes it invulnerable to normal responses? Uh, what does it want to do to you? Mm-hmm. You know, if a monster wants to take your brain, I, I had a dream years ago where monsters would come and they would make an incision in, in the brains of people and they would suck their brains out. <laughs> and then you could, you could go on living, but you just wouldn't have your normal brain, your normal personality, and your normal self. Mm-hmm. Well, I, it, once I described those characteristics, what's the goal of the monster, I knew that it had to do with my job and my boss because oh. it was like the job that ate my brain. And that that makes it easier. Just describe what the characteristics of the monster and what it wants to do to you, and you will see what this pertains to. It's usually a situation or a person. That's fascinating. I know um, that uh, I was told by a friend that they would tend to have in their dreams sort of like a phantom person that was always chasing them, always seemed to be right there no matter where they went. Mm-hmm. What would you think that would be about? Well, that is probably uh, reflecting a person in their life. Now, it could be something that dates back to childhood, um, or it could be more uh, more current in their life. A lot of times we have someone in our lives, and it's all unconscious. It's unconscious on their part, and it's unconscious on the dreamer's part. But there's some kind of unwritten agreement where this person gets to control you, or they get to take your energy, Mm -hmm. or they get to make the decisions for you. And if you violate that unspoken contract you get punished for it. Mm -hmm. Now, those sorts of arrangements that sound, you know, they may may sound codependent, but it's outside of everybody's awareness. But when you sleep, you get to see the actual dark side of that arrangement. And sometimes the mind is trying to make you more aware of this and say, look, you've got to define the boundaries in a different way. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to X that person out of your life, but you do have to change the boundaries. Now, for our listeners out there who tend to or might be having nightmares and especially monsters in their dreams, we were discussing earlier about the reptiles. Women tend to dream more animal symbols you know, later on in life, whereas men tend to dream more of zombies, for instance. What are the positive sides of this, if any, for people to take away from this discussion today? Well, a lot. if, if you can isolate what it is in your life that's stressing you, Having a monster dream can be a trigger to take it more seriously and to treat yourself with more generosity. A lot of times in response to stresses and challenge, what we do is to try to man up, in quotations, or to, to just be tougher or more aggressive. And sometimes what you need to do is to take your own needs more seriously and say, look, I can handle this challenge short term, but long time, long term, I better make a new plan because mm-hmm. this just is not a good fit for me. I don't want to join the zombie squad. Um, I know one woman who was an attorney, and she said, if I keep doing this in 10 or 15 years, I know I'll be dead. So even though she had a great career, she decided to go into becoming a therapist. Wow. That, for her, took a lot of work, but she said it saved her life and saved her soul. And that ended her dreams, which were very much like... Uh, becoming a zombie, but in her dream, it was more like the Borg on Star Trek where you were half human and half machine. And she felt that she was just living like a machine. It wasn't a good fit for her. I can imagine it wouldn't be. (laughs) (laughs) So it sounds to me like sometimes nightmares as adults can actually tell us perhaps it's time to examine our lives and find out the direction that we're going and whether or not it's really working for us or not. Well, that's right, and it can t- it can show you the stage that you are in something. For for example, the werewolf dream that is common to a lot of young men who leave home for the first time, whether they're off in college, whether they're in the military, or whether they've moved in with friends and they have their their first job. And of course, you know, as soon as you get away from your family, you kind of go wild for a couple of years. And a signal that maybe this isn't working for you, or maybe you've gone too far, is the idea that you're turning into a werewolf. That's the way the dream presents. The guy goes into the bathroom, he happens to catch a look at himself in the mirror, and, oh, my God, he's turned into a werewolf, and he's got blood on his face, and he's all covered with hair. And this is an exaggeration, but it's a stark one to say, you know, behind the scenes, you're changing, and you're turning into something that isn't really you. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference between adventure and fun and kicking up your heels and kind of morphing into a different person entirely. So that werewolf dream I hear from a lot of young men who are like really freaked out about it because it's so disturbing. But once we talk about it, they say, you know, that's exactly what's going on. I just need to dial this back and get back to my center. I can still have fun, but I need to stay who I am. 
Now, Jillian, in all the years that you've been involved in, you know, as I understand, you teach uh, a dream course out of uh, Merrill Hurst University uh-huh. in, in Portland, Oregon, and, uh, you know, with your book, The Complete Dream Book, what would you find to be the most unusual monster dreams that you've ever heard of that really just stood out where you went, I think you're really messed up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never I never really think that. Um, uh-huh. Because I know that this is just a this is just a statement from the psyche. It's almost like a work of art, you know. If you've mm-hmm. ever uh, played around with drawing something that was bothering you, so this these are like pictures of of our problems. And I would say probably uh, a combination animal or a combination monster, like you mentioned, the guy that was part man, part cobra. Mm-hmm. Those are the ones that fascinate me. And uh, one dream was a. It was a swamp creature who lived at the bottom of a swamp, mm-hmm. but he also had Tourette syndrome. Wow. So he would, he would curse, you know, and have all these involuntary tics and so forth, and there was this terrible stench around him. Well, he turned out to represent a person in the dreamer's life who was uh, very antisocial and didn't know how to kind of conduct himself with people, but was also, in addition to being scary, there was a, a lot of pathos to this person who really didn't know any better. And so that placed the dreamer in a particular bind about, you know, feeling sorry for him, wanting to help him, but also feeling contaminated by him and all his many problems. And that's an example of how these monsters, even though they're dreadful, they can help articulate the way you feel and the complexity of the way you feel inside and give you more choices around how to to cope with it. Mm. It's always a fascinating subject. Uh, one of the things I'd like to also talk about, too, is are sometimes the monsters that are created in our dreams a cause from perhaps movies we watched, or is that just a light influence to where we actually create our own images of monsters when it comes to the dream world? Well, that's a great question, Daniel, and it's a combination, I feel. We do make imprints. Uh, especially with the first dream, uh, the first movie that really scared the bejeebers out of us, that mm-hmm. tends to become an imprint. The psyche grabs hold of that as the ultimate threat. You know, what if this, you know, giant thing was real, or what if we really did have these things coming up at, from the sewers and into the toilets and jumping out <laughs> at us? Um, whatever it is, no matter how lurid it is, the mind does sort of grab hold of that, and it can represent later a problem that has a particular set of rules or a particular bind that it puts you in so that you can't really deal with it as effectively as you deal with other things. And sometimes that monster will become like the poster boy for problems later on in life as well. Now, let's talk about what a person can do uh, to kind of move forward when they begin or when they're having these dreams, how they can, for one, Kind of take a look and analyze, well, what does this mean to me in, in, in relationship to my life and the choices that I'm making, and what can I do about it? Because dreams, to me, I would think, are sort of like those messages from our subconscious mind that we don't hear when we're in waking life. Uh, what is your thoughts on that? That's exactly the point, um, Daniel, is identify what the monster or the problem represents to you if you can figure out the real-life equivalent. Then, and it shouldn't be too hard, because if you're at the point you're having monster dreams, you already know where your stressors are. Um, Then identify for yourself what makes it hard to deal with. Is it because there's rules? Is it because it's your boss and there's this double-edged sword where you can't, you know, you'd have to do a lawsuit to get the problem solved? There's always something that makes it particularly challenging. So if you sort of write it down, articulate to yourself, what is it that makes this such a, bugaboo to deal with. Mm -hmm. And then, what realistically are your choices? Can you adjust the way you're coping with it? Can you extend your timeline? A lot of times we expect to solve a problem in a week when really it's something that's going to go on for a few years. So you need to stretch out your expectations and your timeline and pace yourself. Sometimes that's the best thing to do. So look at what your realistic choices are. A lot of people really are ashamed of their problems or ashamed of the fact that something's gotten under their skin. So they don't want to confide in anyone because, of course, we're all supposed to be supermen and superwomen these days. Well, if that's, if bottling up and being an island and sort of isolating yourself is making it worse, then pick some people that will keep your confidence that you can confide mm-hmm. in. And that often will diffuse the situation and, and turn it from 
a monster that has super, superhuman powers to something that you can deal with realistically and systematically. That's pretty exciting. And what kind of uh, feedback have you gotten from people who have taken this, what would be considered to be a hero's journey? Well, it is a hero's journey. I, li I like you using that phrase a lot. Um, it is particularly effective. I mean, these monsters are often trials. They can be considered initiations in some cases. They represent our worst fears. And, of course, as you go through life, you're going to encounter your worst fear, even if you're doing everything right and sort of climbing up the, the mountain uh, and making progress. You're going to find at the top of the mountain, oh, look, there's those uh, – super huge bumblebees that I was afraid of when I was five. I mean, we just tend to encounter our worst fears. And being prepared for that uh, and taking it in stride is one of the great things that you can do. Don't expect too much of yourself, but just realize that this is going to be something that you have to handle in a different way at different times of your life. Fascinating. Now, your book is the complete dream book, and I believe that's one of a couple of them. Is that true? That's correct. I have um, four books out now, but if people are troubled with nightmares or monsters, I think the complete dream book is a great place for them to start. It explains why we have such crummy dreams very often, and it doesn't mm. mean that there's anything wrong with you. So it, there's a lot of information about what's typical for people at different ages and different genders and different stressful situations, so it's a good place to start. Ah. Now, <clears throat> what I was going to ask you about the Complete Dream Book is uh, how, when a person decides to get this, is a good way for a person to use this, they just kind of match up a dream they've had with a particular dream that you feature in your book? I mean, you have 28,000 dreams. That's quite a, quite a bit. Well, yeah, and the, re and the reason it's a kind of a, a, a useful book is because this is all about the dreams that are most common in English-speaking countries. And people are stunned to find out, hey, I'm not the only one who lost my teeth. I'm not the only one who had you know, a heart transplant from an alien or something. Th these are common themes, and you can see the stressors that catalyze certain dreams or the good things that catalyze certain dreams. So um, a lot of people get the book and start out thumbing through and looking up their dreams that, they're, that are common to them, you know, the tsunami that comes to, over you or whatever. And then they see that the book is laid out from start to finish, why we have such provocative dreams, why our current dreams contain certain themes, and how this moves through the lifetime. So it's actually a book that you can read from start to finish, and it's not jarring uh, with you know a lot of discontinuity either. Fascinating stuff here, that's for sure. What do you like most about the work that you do for people? Oh, I love seeing behind our dreams, there's mm -hmm. always this tone of encouragement. There is always this implication that you can handle your problems and you can be gentle with yourself. You can forgive your hurts. There's almost a sacred text that's in the background of our dreams, just like it's in the background of literature and holy writings. And for me, looking at people's dreams for the past 25 years has been a, an unfolding where it's taken me really in kind of a spiritual direction and, a, and in a direction of hope, and that's not something that I had at the beginning of the journey. So that's my favorite part. Now, collectively speaking, uh, since you're uh, seeing the idea of hope, especially on a worldwide scale, are you beginning to hear about uh, international dreams that have that thread that move us forward to the possibility of having a peaceful world for a change? Well, it's a really mixed bag right now, Daniel. It's a mixed bag. There, there's a lot of uh, nightmarish dreams about uncertainty, you know, mm -hmm. that homeless people are going to come and take, take over. Well, of course, that's all our collective fear of losing our homes, you know. And it's, it's written large in our dreams. Mm -hmm. A lot of zombie dreams about dehumanizing um, a lot of dreams about aliens that are taking over the world and they have an agenda to cause us to hate one another. And this is uh, the sort of the propaganda of hate being uh, created subtly by aliens whispering in our ears and saying, well, that person over there is the other and you should try and kill him before he kills you. Well, I think this is, this is our collective sense that, that n not everything that we are hearing is accurate and that there is sort of a drumbeat <coughs> of aggressiveness. Behind that, there are a lot of ma magical dreams, a lot of dreams about angels and a lot of dreams about um, spirituality and hope and evolution. And 
that we have around us, that we're never alone, that there is a team um, of non-dimensional beings who are trying to sort of counteract all the negativity and to encourage us. And whether that is a metaphor or whether it's a, a genuine perception of some benevolent force, I think that's very encouraging, that that is filtering through our dreams as well. So for a lot of people, they're making a choice in spite of what they see around them to choose love, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff when it comes to dreams. Uh, Jillian, is there a website people can find out more about your work? <clears throat> yes. My research website is called lifetreks.com. That's L-I-F-E-T-R-E-K-S. There's a place there where you can send in your dream to contribute to my research. And if you need to get a hold of me, there's a contact button there as well. I'd love to hear from you. Jillian Holloway, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Oh, it's a delight as always. Thank you so much, Daniel. We bet. And on behalf of Jillian Holloway and myself, we wish all of you pleasant dreams, sleep tight, and don't let the bed bugs bite. But in the meantime, before you drop your head onto that pillow, be sure to visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com and sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. Also visit us at our blog where we archive our shows and have great resource information for you to use as well as send to other people. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past Avalanche.